tonight on Wings. Take off with the Discovery Channel in the XB-70 Valkyrie. More than a quarter century after its maiden flight, the XB-70 stands as one of aviation's greatest achievements. Designed as a replacement for the Boeing B-52, the XB-70 could travel at three times the speed of sound. Employing technology that was well ahead of its time, the XB-70 is one of the best aircraft designs that never went into production. Tonight, soar high in the XB-70 Valkyrie on wing. This is the XB-70 Valkyrie, a supersonic heavy bomber that featured design innovations decades ahead of the planes of its time. Yet this revolutionary aircraft never went into service because while it was being developed, the strategic picture changed. A decade later, a similar fate almost befell this plane, the B-1 bomber. Apart from modifications to the engine intake, the B-1B seen here looks very similar to its controversial predecessor, the B-1A heavy bomber. However, because of the evolution of technology, the B-1B, in many ways, was a very different aircraft. Like the XB-70, the B-1A was designed to replace the B-52 as the Strategic Air Command's high-altitude heavy bomber. However, due to political conflicts and technical problems, the project was cancelled. But the B-1 didn't die. Over the next several years, the U.S. Air Force and Rockwell, the plane's manufacturer, revised the aircraft's parameters. Taking full advantage of the aircraft's swing-wing potential, Rockwell redesigned the plane for the long-range, low-level mission. The plane was outfitted with the latest detection evasion electronics. But the major difference between the B-1A and the B-1B is simply that the later model, although the product of considerable technical innovation and years of additional development, was actually made to be slower than its predecessor. Radar jamming and stealth technology have changed the specifications for strategic bombing aircraft. But this is a relatively new development. For much of the century, the military constantly sought faster and faster planes. Probably the biggest single step forward in the search for new technology to gain higher speed came with the advent of the jet engine. Although pre-war Germany first utilized jet power, American engineers also tested the concept on experimental aircraft before the war's end, with aircraft like Bell's Aero Comet. The first major development of the post-war years was the record-breaking Bell X-1 rocket-powered experimental aircraft. Dropped from a Second World War bomber on December 9, 1946, in the hands of test pilot Chuck Yeager, the X-1 broke the sound barrier for the first time. Further development produced the X-2, which flew faster and higher than its predecessor. The quest for higher speed put phenomenal stress not only on aircraft, but also on their pilots. The risk of even a minor malfunction at the speeds now being attempted was enormous.
Much of the data gathered by the X-airplane tests was used for military objectives. Faster aircraft would be harder targets to hit. Some of the lessons learned from the X airplane program were applied to American fighters and bombers. With the Cold War on, stretching the boundaries of speed and distance had become a matter of national security. By the mid-50s, the Strategic Air Command, known as SAC, was deploying its first all-jet long-range heavy bomber, Boeing's B-52 Stratofortress. A giant plane with eight jet engines suspended below fully swept wings, the B-52 could fly at speeds of 600 miles per hour with a large payload. But although the B-52 was one of the major successes of post-war aviation, it was not supersonic. The next step in the quest to increase the speed of bomber aircraft came with the B-58 Hustler. This Delta Wing was developed by Convair to produce a bomber aircraft which could actually fly at and sustain supersonic speeds. But to attain this performance, the plane had to be relatively small and could only be classed as a medium bomber. During the early 1950s, when Soviet-American tensions ran high, SAC wanted a bomber at least as large as the B-52, but faster than the Hustler. This was a very tall order for engineers to meet. Taking a heavy bomber past the sound barrier required a phenomenal power source. Temporarily discarding normal jet power as inadequate, aviation companies look towards two alternatives. The first was nuclear power, used successfully to propel submarines. Convair converted a conventional B-36, not unlike this one, to carry aloft a fully commissioned nuclear reactor. The crewmen were insulated by lead shielding, and although no attempt at this stage was made to transfer power to propel the aircraft, tests were carried out in earnest. Various designs were put forward for bombers which would at least in part be nuclear-powered. However, the biggest problem here was the ramifications of a nuclear-powered plane crashing in a populated area. Another proposal to boost power would be equipping bombers with external tanks of fast-burning zip fuel, such as boron. Prior to the plane making its final dash to its target, the enormous fuel tanks would be dropped, lightening the aircraft for the attack. But an ingenious solution to the problem came from North American Aviation. The company had refined the concept of compression lift. Their plan called for mounting six enormous jet engines in a tapered shape under the aircraft, thus forcing air away from the center section at high speed. The design also allowed for this air to be trapped by the outer edge of each wing when it was lowered. 
the compressed air would act to lift the aircraft and help propel it three times the speed of sound. The design was given the name XB-70, and SAC approved it for development in December 1957. North American had a long string of successes, including the development of the twin-engine supersonic vigilante bomber for the U.S. Navy. This aircraft combined speed and bombing capacity never previously available to carriers. But now, having put forward the compression lift concept for a high-speed bomber, North American's big problem was heat. Wind tunnel tests proved that the theory could work, but the great speeds the plane would fly at would produce such heat that all conventional materials would warp. To tackle the problem, North American employed a honeycomb sandwich material made from stainless steel. This offered strength and dissipated heat. After 12 months of testing designs and mock-ups, an order was placed for one XB-70. But the aircraft, now called Valkyrie, was in for a stormy time. Two years after accepting the concept, financial pressures forced the Air Force to limit the production to one prototype. Although extra money was made available in 1960, the Air Force was having trouble holding on to its supersonic bomber. The final blow came with the arrival of Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, who redefined the XB-70 as a high-speed research project and limited production to just two aircraft. But at least the concept was still alive, and its proponents hoped it still might ultimately be accepted for military use. By 1963, at least one aircraft was well underway. The first XB-70, serial number 2001, must have been an awe-inspiring sight for those lucky enough to see it. But it was not until May 11, 1964, that the press and public were given their chance to marvel over North American sleek white wonder. Brigadier General Fred J. Ascani, who directed the B-70 System Program Office, described the plane's various features. Most of the structure in the wings and fuselage is of stainless steel. These are our now famous honeycomb core sandwich panels, and many of the outer skins on these honeycomb panels are as thin as seven one thousandths of an inch. The two-man crew will sit side by side. The crew station in this position is about 20 feet above the ground. All of the uh, space aft of the crew compartment is taken up by fuel, both in the fuselage and in the wings. Before the XB-70 was poised at the downwind end of Palmdale's 12,000-foot runway for its first flight, numerous ground tests would have to be performed. Shortly after its debut to the public, the aircraft was again up on jacks while its electrical and hydraulic support systems were thoroughly tested. All moving surfaces were subjected to vigorous testing. All flight controls, including the forward canards, the elevons, and rudders, were fail tested and tested again. Like so much of the XB-70, the landing gear, which had to support the plane's phenomenal weight, as well as the added stress of landing and takeoff, was, for the time, a unique and brilliantly designed feature.
The forward twin wheels were conventional, but the support gear was required to rotate as well as fold the four-wheel bogey mechanism, which was stored in the limited space available. The whole process of extending or retracting the clever but complex gear could be achieved in a little over 20 seconds. All of the many complex tests that took place during the weeks before the first takeoff were recorded in a special flight test instrumentation package. A self-contained airborne unit, this device was the first of its kind. It was carried in the aircraft's bomb bay and remained with the plane for ground taxiing and in-flight tests. The XB-70 prototype was also subjected to vibration tests that were designed to expose the gigantic fuselage and wing surfaces to the effects of vibration far beyond the point it might encounter in flight. As the aircraft tests proceeded, air crews were introduced to some of the engine's characteristics. Here, at the Arnold Engineering Development Center in Tennessee, a YJ-93 engine was set up in a simulation of the Valkyrie. The engine was installed in a test chamber to give the flight crew their first experience with its enormous power. The conditions were artificial, but similar to what the crew would experience in flight. Seen here is Al White, North American's chief test pilot, the man chosen to command the XB-70's maiden flight. With him is Air Force Colonel Joe Cotton, the co-pilot for much of the early test program. The backup crew shown here are Van Shepard from North American and Lieutenant Colonel Fitzhugh Fulton. For months, these men were embroiled in the business of learning how to fly the world's most advanced and ambitious aviation project. By early September, most of the exhausting static tests had been completed. Now the most revealing tests would begin. Tests with the aircraft in motion. Then, eventually, tests of the XB-70 in flight. Before the engines were fired up, the complicated in-flight recording systems were primed to record every technical event as it occurred. This view of the Valkyrie gives a clear picture of what became known as the six-pack. Tightly grouped together, this phenomenally powerful combination of six jet engines were to propel the Valkyrie to speeds considered impossible only a few years before. Now, hundreds of mechanical functions were checked. They would have to perform perfectly if the Valkyrie project was to succeed. The aircraft was removed from all external power sources. After a series of taxi runs, pilot and technicians were satisfied that the Valkyrie was ready for its maiden flight. On September 21st, 1964, the XB-70A positioned itself at the end of the Palmdale runway
for an historic moment for North American aviation and the United States Air Force. Here, as planned, White and Cotton were in the cockpit. At exactly 8.38, the Valkyrie took to the air for the first time to begin a series of epoch-making test flights. Accompanied by a single chase plane, simple routine checks were made as the pilots experienced the ways of the Valkyrie in flight. One of the first tasks was to retract the aircraft's advanced landing gear, but the mechanism failed to respond. With hundreds of millions of dollars of high technology in his hands, White set the landing gear back into its original position. The gear slowly responded to the cockpit control. Clearly, the first tests were to be made wheels down. Nevertheless, an alternative plan was available, and the plane continued on its maiden flight although one engine was shut down when a warning light flashed. Chase, if you obviously see me leveling off a little high, well, let me know. Over 60 minutes of valuable testing was gained by the time the aircraft headed back home to Edwards Air Force Base. 50 feet. 40. 20. 10. On landing, one of the rear brakes locked, setting that landing gear on fire. Sitting 20 feet above the ground, with the aircraft handling impeccably, the crew had to be told of the fire by the chase plane. Two weeks after its first flight, with its landing gear, engine, and brake problems all resolved, the XB-70 was ready for its second trial. On an early autumn morning, pilot Al White rotated test air vehicle number one into flight. This time, there were two chase planes, so the landing gear retraction could be viewed from both sides. A second attempt was made to lift the gear in flight. Again, anxious moments passed as the chase plane crews watched. Here we go with the gear on the count. Three, two, one, gear up. And up. Three, three lights are out. Looks good. Now the gear is up and door locked. We get the wheel well. 
Now, with the landing gear stowed away, the Valkyrie could begin tests at higher speeds. As the plane climbed to altitude, a warning light flashed in the cockpit, alerting the pilots to a minor failure in one of the hydraulic systems. As a precaution, White lowered the landing gear again and pointed the aircraft towards an alternative destination, Rogers Dry Lake, which provided the security of an 11-mile natural runway. The approach was smooth, the brakes operated effectively, and the Valkyrie made a perfect landing. After the flight, it was learned that a fractured pipe had set off the warning light. But considering the enormous complexity of the aircraft, this and the other problems encountered were hardly unexpected. The pilots reported that the Valkyrie behaved in a predictable and comfortable manner. They were coming to terms with the world's most powerful aircraft. While the first prototype was being tested, construction of the second XB-70 proceeded steadily. The massive tubular fuselage was married to the six-pack. The enormous white fins that would direct the Valkyrie were already in place. Lessons learned from the construction of the first prototype rapidly reduced the manufacturing time of air vehicle number two. The second aircraft differed from the first in a subtle design change. An extra five-degree dihedral was added to the wings to improve flight stability. Here, one of the massive wing tips is being fitted. This unique feature was, until recently, the largest single moving surface unit fitted to an aircraft. The presence of these wingtips would enable the unique compression lift principle to propel North American's brainchild into the trisonic stage. Back at Edwards, air vehicle number one was rising into the sky again. Now, White, Cotton, and the engineers had sufficient confidence to push the Valkyrie beyond the speed of sound. On no less than three occasions, the plane was taken supersonic, then lowered to subsonic flight. But doing this stressed the aircraft, which was designed to be flexible. As a result, much of the thick white paint that covered the aircraft's surface flaked and peeled away. But all concerned would have agreed that it was a small price to pay to get the XB-70 past the speed of sound. However, for this aircraft to reach Mach 3, it would have to go much faster, and testing continued. Mm -hmm. 
October 24th saw the plane's fourth takeoff. At approximately 40,000 feet, the folding tips, which had previously never been used, were lowered to the halfway position. This would improve the aircraft's stability and reduce the wing drag effect. At this stage, Cotton applied full afterburners to the six-pack, and the slender white shape of the Valkyrie began its steady increase in speed. On October 14, 1965, during its 25th flight, at an altitude of 70,000 feet, with wingtips fully lowered, air vehicle number one reached its goal, three times the speed of sound. But despite its technical success and its success at meeting Sachs' need for a heavy bomber many times faster than the B-58 Hustler, the Valkyrie was not destined to be adopted in military service. The Air Force, knowing the plane would not be accepted as a bomber, had tried to acquire 150 Valkyries for a reconnaissance role. But the survivability of high-flying planes over enemy airspace was now considered doubtful. Soviet anti-aircraft missiles had managed to down a U-2 spy plane which could fly at heights previously considered safe from any attack. Missiles also competed with the high-speed bomber concept within the U.S. Air Force. SAC now had intercontinental ballistic missiles to carry their nuclear bombs, weapons that were more economical and unstoppable than airplanes. From the early 1960s on, the ICBM was considered the primary means of delivering nuclear weapons. The ICBM also allowed the U.S. Navy to play a role in strategic bombing, as its submarines offered platforms that were highly mobile and could not be detected, an enormous advantage that Air Force bombers would not enjoy until the advent of the B-1B and the B-2. The XB-70 faced an uncertain future. Despite the Pentagon's decision not to deploy its supersonic bomber, Air Force testing of the two XB-70 prototypes continued. One unique feature of the plane, the crew escape capsule, was a masterpiece of engineering. Should the Valkyrie depressurize, the capsule's clam-like top and bottom shells would automatically roll forward and completely engulf the crew member in an airtight module. From here, the pilot would still have limited control over the aircraft, and if necessary, the entire capsule could be fired from the plane into the air. These capsules were to play a very important part in the final chapter of Air Vehicle No. 2. Seen here, with its slightly raised wings, Air Vehicle No. 2 takes off on a routine test mission on June 8, 1966. Al White was in command, but he had a new co-pilot, Major Carl S. Cross, beside him. Cross was an extremely experienced pilot who had just joined the XB-70 project. At 8.27 in the morning, after testing, the Valkyrie joined a formation with four chase planes. The event would be recorded by an accompanying Learjet. The exercise was simple enough and shouldn't have presented any problems. On the Valkyrie's inside right was an F-104 flown by test pilot Joe Walker. Walker, who was slated to join the XB-70 flight program, probably had more supersonic experience than any man alive. He'd recently completed a flight program on North American's X-15, the fastest plane on Earth. Flying below and slightly behind the Valkyrie's right wing, Walker's F-104 Starfighter somehow veered too close to the Valkyrie.
This shot, taken from the aircraft on the Valkyrie's left, is reversed to give some indication of what Joe Walker may have seen moments before his starfighter collided with the XB-70's wingtip. Possibly the vector effect on the giant bomber pulled the little fighter into its massive wingtip. In any event, in a matter of seconds, the F-104 was hit and rolled into an inverted position across the top half of the Valkyrie's massive frame. As it did so, it struck both the XB-70's vertical fins and the left wingtip before it fell thousands of feet to its destruction. Then, with a dreadful shudder, the Valkyrie rolled over and started a steep spin. Al White reached for the ejection mechanism within his capsule and was fired out of the stricken aircraft seconds before it struck the desert. His co-pilot was not so lucky and remained in the plane. Probably the G-forces of the descent stopped his ejection. By 936, air vehicle number two was reduced to a smoldering carcass in the desert. Emergency helicopters rushed to the site but there was little chance that Major Cross could have survived. However, about 10 miles away, the escape capsule containing Al White was spotted. White was badly injured, and over the next several days, his life hung in the balance. His capsule had not landed correctly, but mercifully, his pilot seat had broken when it reached the ground, reducing the impact. Over the days that followed, technicians and project officials studied the wreckage for clues. But the story was simple enough. Somehow, the little F-104 fighter had accidentally collided with the largest plane in the world. And on that fateful morning, in one action, America lost two brave test pilots and one of the only two Valkyries ever to be produced. Al White, the Valkyrie's first pilot, and the man who flew more flights of the XB-70 than anyone else recovered from the crash, but never flew the XB-70 again. After air vehicle number two crashed, the remaining XB-70 continued to be tested over a period of five years. It was to log 83 test flights, and the research that it and it alone could do would provide valuable information for supersonic transport evaluation and many other projects relating to size, weight, heat, and speed. But in some ways, the Valkyrie had also been a military success. Years later, it was learned that the Soviet Union so feared the potential of the XB-70 that it had tried to develop its own smaller version. The Soviets' fear of the Valkyrie was also demonstrated in another way. For it's now known that the Russians developed, at tremendous expense, the high-performance MiG-25 Foxbat. This fighter's sole function was to protect Russia from high-flying supersonic bomber aircraft. Aircraft like the Valkyrie. 
The paradox was that it seems likely that Russian scientists used North American's vigilante bomber as the pattern for the Foxbat. The similarities are just so close, both in size and in shape, that it seems certain that Soviet designers used American research of the early 1950s to protect the Soviet Union from American bombers of the 1960s. Eventually, the one remaining Valkyrie was phased out of test service. Air Vehicle No. 1 landed for the last time at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, home of the United States Air Force Museum. Piloted by Fitzhugh Fulton and Ted Stumthall, it was still collecting valuable data even on its last flight. Shortly before it was signed over to the museum curator, complete with its logbook and a brief ceremony, one of the pilots is reported to have said, I would give anything to keep the Valkyrie in the air, except pay for it myself. The Valkyrie program had been expensive. The cost of the project, divided by the number of flights, cost American taxpayers $11 million every time it took to the air. But there can be little doubt that North American aviation engineers had not only achieved a technical wonder, they had produced one of the world's truly great planes.